Welcome to the lecture on environmental microbiology. In the earlier lectures, I tried to impress upon you that, the, that all microorganisms are very diverse in nature. So because of their diversity, we basically find microbes everywhere on Earth. They have the ability to adapt to different environments found on Earth. We can find them in areas where the conditions are very extreme to the more moderate or, temp or temperate conditions. Scientists believe that the majority of microbes still have yet to be discovered. The reason that they believe this is that we've solely depended on the ability to culture microorganisms, that is to grow them in the laboratory settings. However, if we do not understand their metabolic needs, their environmental needs, that we still are not able to grow them. Therefore, just because we don't see them does not mean that they exist. This became apparent as new genomic techniques have been improved. We were able to then isolate and identify DNA from different organisms. Thus, while, <clears throat> while we're waiting to be able to culture these organisms, we still can identify them due to the presence of their, of their genomes that we isolate from various um, regions. The, big, the best examples are the fact that we found some microbial genomes deep in the Earth's core, as well as deep in the glaciers. So these are very extreme conditions, very, very hot versus very, very cold. As we learn more about these organisms based on their, their genomes, as we understand what, what genes are encoded in their genomes, hopefully someday we'll learn how to, how to grow them and to identify them or characterize them further. The topic of this lecture series deals more on how these microbes actually interact with their environment and how they impact their environment. Basically, if we were to wipe the Earth uh, from all its living microorganisms, life on Earth would cease to exist. That means that you and I would not be here. Therefore, it is worth to, to visit how these microorganisms actually impact our lives. As we study microbes more and more, we start to find out that these organisms have a big impact on the biotic and abiotic factors found on the Earth's environment. So what are these? Let's define what a biotic factor means. So any biotic factor is anything that's living or dead organisms. So we know that microorganisms have a very big impact on our lives. Let's compare this to abi abiotic factors. These are the non-living components found on, on Earth's biosphere. I'll come back to the biotic factors when I talk more about normal flora that's found in our body versus pathogenic organisms and see how they impact our lives. But indirectly, they do impact our lives by interacting with the non-living components found on Earth's biosphere because we're all here together and we all share these components. So just to give you a brief list of what these components are, they are the atmospheric gases, the minerals that are found in the Earth, the water that's present, we're all going to use water, the temperature, they affect the temperature in the Earth's atmosphere, as well as the light. The light's very important for producers of organic matter. So we're going to show you today, or I'm going to show you today, how these organisms interact with the abiotic factors. First, it's important to say that this Earth is considered as a biosphere and is essentially a closed system. So that means that all the elements that are present within the Earth's biosphere cannot be destroyed or will not be created. So the elements that we've had three, three, four and a half billion years ago are the same elements in the Earth's atmosphere that we have today. Some of these elements are more essential than others. And today we're going to talk about the following. We're going to talk about carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We've already talked about oxygen, and this will come apparent today in the lecture kind of indirectly. What I want you to appreciate in today's lecture is that microorganisms play a very important role 
in recycling these elements. These cycles are very important because organisms can only take up elements in a certain nature, in a certain format. As an example, nitrogen gas. We need nitrogen to be incorporated inside our amino acids as well as inside our nucleotides. However, we cannot take nitrogen gas directly and use that element or those, those atoms and put them directly into our amino acids. We're going to need microorganisms that are going to convert nitrogen gas into ammonia, into nitrites, nitrates, and then other organisms place the uh, nitrogen inside amino acids, in which then we take over, we take these amino acids. So we're all dependent on each other, and these microorganisms are going to have a very important way of, of recycling these elements. They're going to do this through the biological, that is through different organisms, through the geological, that is min through minerals, and through chemical mechanisms. They're going to make and break bonds, covalent bonds. We're going to call these cycles the biogeochemical cycles. So this is going to include the three mechanisms. So as the term implies, biogeochemicals, these elements are going to be cycled between abiotic and the biotic environments. So some of these elements are going to be found in the atmosphere. Some of them will be found in the rocks and minerals. These are going to be the abiotic, the non-living components. You're going to see that these microorganisms are going to recycle these, these chemicals or these elements from living organisms or dead organisms, whichever is the case. That's going to be the biotic factors or the biotic environments. These cycling or recycling um, events are very important to help maintain a general balance of these nutrients within the biosphere. Now, if they didn't do this, these elements would actually build up in, in, in more in the abiotic or the biotic factor, and it would be considered a dead end. So we need to, to remove them so that they can cycle between these two environments. It's very important so that the whole source is not depleted. Now during the semester I also, also tried to uh, impress upon you that there are certain microorganisms that we consider as being producers of organic matter. You have some that are considered consumers, so they're going to require the uptake of organic matter to make more of their their um, cellular components. And then you're going to have those that are considered as decomposers. So again, remember, when we talk about organic matter, we generally talk about molecules that contain carbon in them. So the producers, they're going to be the organisms or the microorganisms that produce organic molecules. They're going to take small carbon molecules, the inorganic ones, such as carbon dioxide, and convert them into larger organic molecules. So by definition, they're considered as autotrophs. Autotrophs meaning that they're going to convert carbon dioxide into organic molecules. The majority of these organisms are going to use sunlight as a source of energy to make ATP so that they can covalently bind these carbon dioxide molecules together to make carbohydrates. So we're going to say the majority of them are photosynthetic or photoautotrophs. There are some microorganisms that actually use inorganic molecules to, to break apart their covalent bonds to extract the energy to make ATP. So then again, they can use this energy to take carbon dioxide molecules and make organic molecules. We're going to call these chemoautotrophs. Overall, as I mentioned, they all convert carbon dioxide into larger organic molecules. We're going to compare that to the consumers, which by definition are the heterotrophs. These group of organisms are going to take the organic molecules made by the producers and break them down to either extract their energy in the form of ATP or to make other organic molecules. Again, these can be broken down as photoheterotrophs or chemoheterotrophs. The photoheterotrophs need to make ATP using, uh, by using the sunlight as a source of energy to break down these organic molecules. We are chemo chemoheterotrophs because we can take 
large organic molecules such as carbohydrates, such as glucose, and break it down to extract energy, as well as using glucose to make our amino acids and our nucleotides. All in all, the consumers or the, the heterotrophs are going to release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere that's going to be used by the producers, the autotrophs. To the right, I'm showing you a what we call a trophic pyramid trophic being T-R-O-P-H-I-C. We're showing you at the bottom base or the base of the pyramid are the producers. So this is where the autotrophs are found. So you will find the plants, the algae, and certain bacteria that are considered producers. They're going to form the base of this pyramid. They're going to be the producers of all the organic molecules found in the Earth's biosphere. So they're going to take the carbon dioxide, convert them into organic molecules. Then we have the herbivores. These are the first step of consumers. These consumers are going to eat the plants, eat the algae, eat the bacteria, and use the organic molecules that were made by the producers. In turn, these herbivores are eaten by carnivores, the second layer of, producer, of consumers. They're going to acquire the organic molecules that were produced by the herbivores. And then we usually have a carnivore uh, at the peak, which is a third row of consumers. So you can see the food chain. Now what we have to the left of this pyramid is a smaller pyramid. These are the decomposers. We're going to consider the decomposers also as heterotrophs, but their job is to help release organic molecules back into, into the atmosphere. So they're going to help release the organic matter back into inorganic molecules and while they undergo their metabolism, they too, just like the consumers, will release the carbon dioxide back into their atmosphere. Now the point that I'd like to also stress here, since this is microbiology, is that microorganisms are the only living organisms that will exist in all of these three major trophic levels, the producers, consumers, and decomposers. Now the construction of this tropic pyramid uh, tells you that, that, these, that the carbon molecules, since carbon is the basis of organic matter, uh, will be recycled between the producers and the consumers. And the fact that microorganisms are found in these three trophic levels are an, an attestment of the power that these microorganisms have at maintaining a certain cycle of carbon. So let's discuss carbon and its importance in nature. Now, as we know, carbon is uh, an element found on the periodic table of elements. It has six neutrons, six protons, and six electrons, and its atomic mass is 12.001 atomic mass units. That's the chemical part. Where do we find carbon in nature? Mostly, you're going to find carbon in the form of minerals, such as diamond and coal. Now what determines whether carbon is going to be stored as a diamond or as in coal is basically how it bonds together. So here I show you a figure on the top left corner as well as at the bottom left corner. This is going to be carbon covalently binding to other carbon, so it's pure carbon. This is what a diamond looks like. If you were to break apart the atoms and look at how they interact with each other, they basically form this lattice network. These covalent bonds, since we know that covalent bonds are the strongest bonds in nature, this is going to make diamond the, most, the, the strongest element found on Earth. Let's compare that to coal, or in this case it's graphite. That's going to be shown in the top center picture, as well as the bottom right picture. Basically you're going to have layers and layers of carbons that come together as hexagons. They're going to form strong covalent bonds. And these layers are going to interact together with weaker bonds. So these weaker bonds are going to make coal much more fragile than diamonds. It's going to change the, the complete nature of this carbon uh, molecule. 
Next, we're going to find that carbon is mostly found in the form of organic molecules, such as in our body. We're going to have carbon that forms our protein, our nucleic acids, and our lipids. The top left figure here shows you two amino acids that are joined together to form a peptide bond. If you recall, amino acids are the monomers or the building blocks of polypeptides, which form every protein in our body. So if you see here that there are two carbon atoms, they're the ones that are found in the grayish type color. They're going to interact with oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We'll come back to nitrogen since we'll talk about the nitrogen cycle in a moment. So since every protein is made uh, through a combination of 20 amino acids, all our proteins are going to require carbon. If we move to the center top in the right top image, this is a nucleotide. Nucleotides are composed of a sugar residue, whether it's deoxyribose or ribose, depending whether it's DNA or RNA. They're going to be composed with a phosphate group, as well as the nitrogenous base. Now both the nitrogenous base and the sugar molecules have carbon in them. They're not quite drawn here, but every corner of these, of these geometric structures basically implies that there is a carbon atom present at that angle. If you look at that nitrogenous base on the top right corner, there are five different nitrogenous bases. And besides having nitrogen and hydrogen uh, and oxygen, there's going to be carbon atoms tied up in there. So again, carbon is very essential to form our nucleic acids, which are the building blocks of our nucleotides, which form our DNA, or our chromosomes, and our RNA, which forms our messenger RNA. If we look at the bottom left-hand corner, this is a generic picture of a phospholipid. If you recall, phospholipids are very important for all our membranes, whether it's our cell membrane, or all the membranes that surround our organelles, including our our, nucle uh, our nuclear envelopes. So if you look at the long fatty acid chains, they're going to have carbons in there. I'm showing you the fatty acids or lipids in the bottom right hand corner. This is stored as fat in our body. It's a long term energy source. Again, all those carbons. So the point of showing you those pictures, again, was to impress upon you the amount of carbon that is incorporated inside all living organisms inside each cell. But besides finding carbon mostly in minerals and organic molecules, we can find smaller amounts in the form of carbon dioxide, which is found in our atmosphere as a gas, as well as methane gas, which is found as fossil fuels deep to the core of the, of the earth or the bottom of the oceans. So let's see how carbon can cycle between these, uh, these four categories. So this figure is that of the carbon biogeochemical cycle. We're going to start with carbon dioxide. That is the uh, small amount of carbon found in the Earth's atmosphere. Besides the atmosphere, it's also found dissolved in the oceans or in the water, the fresh water. So as the living organisms metabolize complex molecules, they're giving off carbon dioxide, which stays in the water as well as some of the atmospheric carbon dioxide gets dissolved from the surface. But just in the atmosphere itself, in the air, carbon dioxide only makes up 0.038, we almost say 0.04% of the gases in the atmosphere that we breathe in. The remaining gases are oxygen and nitrogen and a few trace gases, with nitrogen being the most prominent gases present in the atmosphere. The autotrophs that are present in the Earth's biosphere are going to take this carbon dioxide and convert it into organic molecules. So who are the autotrophs? The members that are the plants, the algae, and a few bacteria. This ability of taking carbon that's present in carbon dioxide and incorporate it into carbohydrates is called carbon fixation. Now where does the carbon go to once it's in the carbohydrates? It then is be, uh, utilized in the form of amino acids, nucleic acids or nucleotides, and lipids. So the process of first entering into from carbon dioxide to carbohydrates is a very essential process.
So if you look at this picture, there are two sources of the autotrophs. Those are the plants, the algae and cyanobacteria that are found on land, as well as the plants, algae and cyanobacteria found in the water. Now if you go back to that trophic uh, pyramid that I showed you earlier, you saw the base of the pyramid was made out of the producers, the autotrophs. So now the autotrophs have made organic matter. Now the consumers and the, decompos the decomposers will come and take up these organic molecules that are now in the form of amino acids, lipids, nucleotides, and they will eat them and take up these molecules as their own. In the process, they're going to metabolize some of these organic molecules, such as glucose. They're going to make ATP, and in the process, again, they will release carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. This carbon dioxide will be reused by autotrophs and start the process all over again. These consumers are going to be found on land. They can be macroorganisms, such as the deer, but they can also be microorganisms, such as bacteria and flatworms, the helmets that we didn't discuss, they can also be present within the soil. Besides the land and the soil, there will also be a, a population of consumers found in, in the water, both fresh water and marine water. And as these organisms die, you're going to have the decomposers, the fungi, as well as some bacteria, which will then secrete enzymes and break apart the macromolecules that are present in these organisms that were once living and release these macromolecules. Some of these macromolecules can then be taken up by other organisms directly or they will also be broken down into smaller uh, molecules such as organic molecules will be broken down into carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is then released back into the atmosphere and then is then taken up again by the autotrophs. However, over time, some of these carbon atoms will be temporarily removed from the carbon biogeochemical cycle. They're going to be stored in the form of coal, methane gas, and oil. These are known as collectively as our fossil fuels. So we have some archaea organisms that live in the oceans, and they produce methane gas. Because of the pressures of the water, this methane gas will sink at the bottom of the oceans and stay there. So we'll have a very thick layer of methane gas. Also, in this picture we have some mammals or trees, and as they die, if they're not decomposed immediately by the, by the fungi, some of them will get buried inside the earth, and with the pressure of the earth and the temperature of the earth, they will become fossilized. And so they will make the fossil fuel, they will make the petroleum products. As long as that methane gas remains trapped in the bottom of the oceans, it's going to, it's going to remove the carbon from, this, from its cycle. However, if we mine it and then burn it, the process of burning carbon uh, methane, which is CH4, which is a carbon covalently bonded to four hydrogen atoms, we're going to release that carbon inside the atmosphere, outside the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. And so by burning a lot of methane gas, we're going to release a lot of carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide traps the, the heat of the Earth within its atmosphere and is considered a form of the greenhouse gases. Likewise, as we mine the fossil fuel in the form of oil, we refine that oil, we use it to, to warm our houses, to run our cars. By burning this fossil fuel, we're then releasing more carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. By man's intervention, by releasing more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're um, creating an imbalance in the overall distribution of carbon molecules or carbon atoms. Again, this is the basis for global warming. We believe by having a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're preventing the Earth from cooling off and we're, we're thus creating uh, global warming. Okay, having said that, we're going to leave carbon for the moment, and we're going to go and look at the nitrogen biogeochemical cycle. There's going to be some similarities with that at carbon, except we're going to start with nitrogen that's found in the atmosphere.
I just told you that carbon is critical for all living organisms because it's found in all the macromolecules, the organic molecules that compose the, the, the cells of all organisms. Similar, nitrogen is going to be critical for all living organisms. It's going to be part, or an atom, that's part of the proteins or the amino acids and the nucleic acids found in every single cell. So these are the same images that I showed you for amino acids and for nucleotides. If you look carefully, besides carbon, you can also easily find nitrogen in both of these molecules. In the top left-hand corner are the amino acids joining together to form a polypeptide. The molecules that are in purple color, that is the, the nitrogen atoms. And if you look at the lower half of the slide, you see in the nitrogenous bases, the adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil, which are common in RNA and DNA molecules, you will find nitrogen atoms present there. Uh, the most prominent form of nitrogen is that of nitrogen gas, N2. So two atoms of nitrogen covalently bonded to each other. In fact, nitrogen gas comprises 80% of the atmospheric gas. However, most organisms, including ourselves, we cannot use nitrogen in the air directly. We need to acquire our nitrogen as another form. Nonetheless, we breathe in a lot of nitrogen, but we also can breathe it back out without utilizing this nitrogen and incorporating it inside our, our molecules. Plants uh, that use nitrogen, they'll use it in the form of nitrates or ammonia. And we'll talk about how they acquire this, the nitrogen in this form. For the, the purpose of converting nitrogen gas into nitrates and ammonia, we're going to have to deal with the microorganisms. They're going to play a major role. So as we go through the nitrogen biogeochemical uh, cycle, I'd like you to keep in mind these three forms of usable forms of nitrogen. That is the ammonia, which plants can use, nitrates, that is also used by plants, but also as well as some nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and nitrites, which is only, uh, only used by certain bacteria. Notice that humans cannot use any of these forms. The other point also that is worth mentioning is that nitrogen is very limited in the soils. Now it is a good thing because if it was more plentiful, you'd see actually algal blooms that we've talked about, or we'd see a, a robust growth of other organisms. So the fact that nitrogen is a limited source in the soil or in the water, you're gonna see limited growth in plants as well as microorganisms. So with that, keep this in mind, let's go back to the nitrogen biogeochemical cycle. We're going to start with nitrogen gas, N2. Again, it's the largest source of nitrogen on Earth, and it comprises 80% of the Earth's atmosphere. In this case, microorganisms are very, very important in converting nitrogen gas into ammonia or into nitrates and nitrites. These will be the usable forms in which other organisms can incorporate nitrogen inside their, their molecules. So to begin, we're going to start out with the atmospheric nitrogen that's sort of going to enter the soil as N2. It's going to be reduced by key bacteria that are present in the top layer of the soil, and they're going to form ammonia, NH3. This process of converting nitrogen gas into ammonia is called nitrogen fixation. It's going to be carried out by two populations of bacteria, those that are free living in the soil and those that are going to live within the root nodules of legumes. We're going to say that these, the latter half are symbiotic organisms. They're going to live along with these legumes. Some of them are peas, alfalfa sprouts. They are going to utilize the, the capability of the bacteria to make ammonia, and they will use ammonia directly and incorporate that inside their amino acids and their nucleotides. Whereas the free living bacteria are going to fix um, nitrogen into the form of ammonia, and other organisms that are present in the soil will then convert ammonia into another usable source.
So within the mixed population of bacteria that are present in the soil, those that cannot take up ammonia, they will then oxidize the ammonia in the form of nitrites, which will then convert them into nitrates, NO3 minus. These microorganisms are known as chemoautotrophs because the purpose of extracting the electrons is, uh, from ammonia in order to make nitrate is a way of extracting out the energy. So they're going to use an inorganic molecule, such as ammonia, that's the chemo aspect, and then they're going to use that energy to assimilate carbon dioxide and form carbohydrates. So that's the autotroph aspect. So as you can see here, that a waste product of one molecule, those are the uh, microorganisms that take nitrogen gas and convert it to ammonia, they're then going to take the ammonia as a form of, of uh, metabolism to make energy, and they're going to give off nitrates and nitrites. From this, other organisms are going to take the waste product and utilize that as part of their metabolism. So again, the energy that they form in this case from the chemoautotrophs, they're going to take carbon dioxide and oxidize it and produce carbohydrates. These carbohydrates will then be used to make all the organic molecules present in, these, uh, in the cells. Now the nitrates that escaped from these previous chemoautotrophs can then be converted back into nitrogen gas, which then will go back into the atmosphere. This will occur in the stage of anaerobic cellular respiration. So anaerobic, because nitrogen, which is very electronegative, it's going to acquire the final electrons. It'll be the final electron acceptor during the electron transport chain, but anaerobic, so it's going to do this in the absence of oxygen. Therefore, this will occur deep in the soil where there's very little oxygen. However, not all the nitrates will be released in the form of nitrogen gas. Some of the nitrates will then be picked up by the plants. So these nitrates will be present in the soil. They will be absorbed through the root nodules or the root hairs of the plants and then become incorporated inside the, their organic matter, such as the amino acids and the, nitrate, uh, the nucleotides. In this case, the herbivores then can eat these plants. They can acquire the amino acids and the nucleotides that are full of carbon and nitrogen atoms. They will then use them, and then eventually as they die, they will settle on the, the, the forest floor. And this is where the decomposers come into play. As dead organic matter accumulates in, on the earth, you'll have these decomposers that will help release the nitrogen back inside into the environment. Fungi will help release the ammonia, and this ammonia can then be reconverted into nitrites and nitrates, or then can be converted back into nitrogen gas. So again, I hope that you can appreciate that these fungi, as well as some of these soil bacteria, play a very, very important role of releasing both nitrogen and carbon atoms back into the, uh, the biogeochemical bio cycles. On a side note, there will also be a source of industrial nitrogen that's present. This source is in the, in the form of nitrates and ammonia. Now generally, when farmers raise crops, they want their plants to grow very well. And because there's limited sources of nitrogen in the soil, these plants are going to grow very, very slow unless the farmers add fertilizer. Usually this fertilizer has nitrogen present and it's going to be present in these two forms, the nitrates and ammonia. Now generally, by adding these nitrogen sources into the, to the fields has very little consequences. However, if these fields are found close to a water source and there's a lot of rain and such that the runoff water enters these water supplies, you're going to find that this uh, large concentration of nitrogen is going to form a very uh, it's going to form a problem with the ecosystem found in the water system. So keep this in mind when we come back to eutrophication. I've included this slide as well as the next slide in your handout just because I thought it represented the nitrogen cycle very nicely. In this case, it included both the terrestrial 
sources of nitrogen as well as the aquatic form or source of nitrogen. As you can see that the, the two cycles sort of mimic each other. Again, the, pers the point of adding this slide is because um, they did discuss a lot of bacteria. So we have the atmospheric nitrogen that makes its way uh, to the left of the slide in which you have nitrogen fixate fixating bacteria that lives near the lagoon roots. So these are the, so the form of bacteria that make ammonia. The ammonia is then assimilated inside the legumes in which they can incorporate the nitrogen inside their amino acids as well as their nucleotides. You also have nitrogen fixing bacteria that are then going to take the ammonia and make nitrates and nitrites. These uh, forms of nitrogen then will be uh, taken up into other plants. Again, they will be incorporated inside of amino acids and nucleotides. As these plants are growing, or um, they're going to be uh, used as food by herbivores. So we have the rabbit here. Um, these herbivores and carnivores, as they, as they die and decompose, you're going to have the fungi in the middle, as well as some bacteria, that will then release these trapped um, nitrogen elements back into the environment. So in order to help you keep these uh, pathways straight, I've included this slide of these five terms. That is the nitrogen fixation, that's taking nitrogen gas that's present in the atmosphere and making it in the form of ammonia. That's fixing nitrogen. And then the nitrification is taking that ammonia and converting it to nitrites and then to nitrates. The point of taking these nitrates and placing them into organic molecules such as amino acids and nucleotides, that's called assimilation. That is taking the nitrogen and putting it into the, our cells, basically. And also the ammonification, that's when we have uh, the decomposers. They're going to break down these organic molecules, make waste, they're going to remove the amino groups from, carb from amino acids, as an example, and they're going to release ammonia back into the atmosphere. That's ammonification. Again, you have some bacteria that take the ammonia, break down into its uh, most simple components, such as nitrogen and hydrogen. So in this case, the nitrogen gas is then released back inside the atmosphere. That's denitrification. So you should know what these terms are. And look at these terms and go back to the previous slides that I showed you so that you can know where, uh, which major organism uh, can undergo nitrogen fixation, nitrification, etc etc this now brings us to the third biogeochemical -geo cycle that is that of phosphorus unlike the nitrogen and, and the carbon that we mentioned phosphorus is not found very plentiful in the atmosphere in fact it's mostly trapped inside rocks so as these, as these rocks are broken or decomposed and as, as when you have water that filters through these rocks, this phosphorus is then going to be released. It's going to be released inside the soil as well as in the water. It's going to be released also in the form of phosphates, that is PO4. As this phosphate leaches into the water, it will get into the ocean and then it can get incorporated back into the rocks where it will be trapped again. It's a very, very slow cycle. But again, we don't really need a lot of phosphorus. The only time that we see phosphorus inside our cells is in the phospholipids that make up our cell membranes. So when phosphates are present in the soil, they will be taken up by the plants where they will be incorporated inside our DNA. So all oh, that's the other, the other place that I forgot to mention is that we have the sugar phosphate backbone of nucleotides. So the phosphates will be taken up, they will make the phospholipids, they will make the uh, nucleotide backbones. Then the herbivores will take up this form of phosphate in their diet. Then comes the carnivores, etc, etc. And then the decomposers again play another major role. As the phosphates accumulate, they can sediment to the bottom of the, of the water where they will become part of new rocks or new minerals. And then the whole cycle starts all over again.
In terms of the sulfur biogeochemical cycle, it is very dependent upon microorganisms. Sulfur is very important for key amino acids that are part of our, our proteins. And so you're going to find sulfur tied up in the atmosphere. It's going to be also found in proteins as well as waste products, metabolic waste. These microorganisms are going to decompose that metabolic waste and release the amino acids. These amino acids are, then can be taken up by other organisms or they can be broken down by microorganisms that we call uh, that can undergo desimilation. So they're going to take these amino acids, break them down into the components, and they're going to give off hydrogen sulfide, H2S. And so the two amino acids that have sulfur are methionine and cysteine. Now remember that every amino acid or every protein starts with the very first amino acid of methionine. So it's a very, very important amino acid. So these organisms are going to desimilate uh, amino acids into hydrogen sulfide. This sulfide molecule then can be used as an energy for chemoautotrophs. They're going to make ATP. They're going to reduce this hydrogen sulfide, H2S, in the form of a hydrogen sulfate, H2SO4. In this case, some plants as well as micro, other microorganisms can take the hydrogen sulfate and form amino acids. They'll take the sulfur and use it as part of their metabolic pathway to produce more amino acids. So in this case, if you look at the next, at the bottom uh, or the next slide, which is part of your handouts, you'll see these pathways of the sulfur cycle. And the point that I want to stress again is that microorganisms play a very vital role to maintain this cycle. Now in addition, what I didn't mention is that we can also burn fossil fuel. Remember by burning fossil fuels you can release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can also release sulfates and you can also produce H2SO3 which can then be the cause of acid rain. So hydrogen sulfate is very acidic in nature and so it, when it rains and a lot of hydrogen sulfate is present in the atmosphere it's going to come back into the soil. It's going to cause ac acidification of forests. Some plants cannot live under acid conditions and this leads to deforestation. It will kill some of the forests. So we're going to leave the sulfur biogeochemical cycle now and what I hope to impress upon you is that there's a certain balance in which these elements have to be found in nature. They're going to be more abundant in certain areas as than in others but when we break that balance then we sort of uh, affect other ecological niches. Some of these niches or habitats that I'm mentioning here are the soil, fresh water, as well as marine water or aquatic environments. By going through these four biogeochemical cycles that I've just mentioned, you could probably guess the importance of microorganisms and their roles that they play in maintaining a healthy soil as well as a, a uh, um, healthy organisms that live in fresh water as well as in the marine biology. As in the soil, microorganisms are very, very important in establishing a, a healthy soil in fact that they release acids. So part of the metabolic waste is to release these acids that will help break down rocks into smaller particles to make sand and then sand into soil. They'll also contribute to organic molecules that are part of the soil. So they're going to contribute to the nutrients in the soil by decomposing organic matter and fixing nitrogen. These microorganisms are going to be most active near the surface of the soil. So approximately the, the, the top layer, the, the top layer of soil that is about one foot deep is where you're going to see the most microorganism activity. Now these soils that have plenty of, of microorganisms living in, in that soil, they're going to be rich in organic matter. So that means that they're going to have a lot of carbon. 
However, there's going to be very little inorganic matter, such as the nitrogen and the phosphorus. So they're going to be limited, and this is going to determine the, the rate at which microorganisms can grow. So the inorganic material that we're talking about here is mostly the nitrogen and the phosphorus. They're going to be found in trace amounts, whereas carbon is going to be found abundant. Besides these three elements, these microorganisms are going to need water and oxygen. So if they're in a well-drained soil, they can have a lot of oxygen. So these microorganisms are going to be aerobic in nature. If the uh, soil is waterlogged, such as near marshes, it's going to be very little oxygen, at least free oxygen. And so these organisms are going to probably survive mostly by anaerobic conditions. Now if we talk about the microorganisms in the, a body of water, whether it's fresh water or marine water, they're going to be found in certain areas, so different zones. So we can basically separate these zones as the littoral zone. This is going to be the zone that's going to be on the edge of these water, whether it's fresh water or um, ocean waters. Along this zone, you're going to have a lot of plants. So these plants are going to live, they're going to produce organic matter, as well as when they die, you're going to have decomposers that will release this organic matter. So in other words, they're going to be the producers, they're going to be, be the beginning of the food chain. As you move away from the shoreline, you're going to still stay at the surface of these, uh, these water bodies of water. This is going to be known as the limnetic zone. So it's going to be the surface of open water. You're going to have a lot of producers in the form of algae and cyanobacteria. They're going to live on the dissolved carbon dioxide. They're going to use the light that's available to photosynthesize, to make energy. So these are going to be photoautotrophs. They're going to be the producers of organic matter for the uh, marine biology. The zones just beneath the limnetic zone will be the profundal zone. You will find another class of producers here in which there's very little oxygen and there is going to be some light available but instead of being photoautotrophic there's going to be chemoautotrophic. So they're going to use inorganic molecules as a source of energy. There still be, will be some dissolved carbon dioxide and so they're going to oxidize that carbon dioxide to make carbohydrates. Now as we go deeper down to the bottom, the, the very bottom uh, zone of these aquatic bodies, we're going to call it the benzic zone. Where, this is where you're going to have sulfur reducing bacteria. They're going to reduce sulfates and to form hydrogen sulfide. There'll be no light and there'll be very little dissolved oxygen. So they're going to be some producers as well, uh, mostly consumers I should say. This image basically shows you how those zones are divided. Now remember I told you that in the soil the amount of growth of microorganisms is very dependent on the inorganic molecules. So just like in the soil, the amount of microbes that will be found in these aquatic ecosystems, whether it's fresh or marine bodies of water, will depend greatly on the availability of these nutrients. Again, the nutrients will be the inorganic nutrients. So in low nutrient environments, when there's very little nitrogen and phosphorus, the microbes will tend to grow on the surface where the nutrients are most available. So remember, on the surface we'll have carbon dioxide and we'll have a lot of light for energy. So the photoautotrophs will grow abundantly. The microbe population in the aquatic environment is also strongly affected by the gradient of light and oxygen. So if the water is clear, more light will penetrate through the, uh, through the water, more photosynthesis will occur. If there's a lot of oxygen, then the aerobic organisms can grow. So again, as we've learned when we talked about the algae, we found that light is most available on the surface of the water and will decrease as you go further and further in depth. So water with abundant nutrients though, so if we add a lot more nutrients such as the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, we're going to see larger numbers of microbes that will be present. This will disrupt the balance of the ecosystem. And this disruption is going to be called eutrophication. 
Usually eutrophication begins with the excess amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that's present inside bodies of water. So I have here that overabundance of nutrients in lakes and streams are usually caused by the addition of organic matter. This organic matter usually takes the form of sewage that is then um, just released inside the water. It can also be caused by the presence of inorganic matter such as these phosphates and nitrogens that are usually uh, enter the water through runoff. So if we have excessive rain and the rain will uh, cannot be absorbed inside the, the, the ground, it will then run off into the streets, into the sewers, etc. Um, or right in directly from the land into the rivers that then feed into the water, the lakes and the oceans. Now when we have an, an addition of these nutrients, we've talked about algal blooms in the form of red tide. But we're going to see that algal blooms can also be uh, other types of algae growth. So in this picture, they basically took a river and they divided it in half. On the left side is a nice rich forest where there's a lot of uh, plants growing. So they're taking the carbon dioxide in the air. They're going to create it into organic mo uh, molecules, etc. And the lake on the, uh, the, the river on the left is going to be very rich in oxygen and there's going to be very little uh, inorganic matter such as nitrogen, phosphorus. So the amount of organic microorganisms or the, the number of organisms that are present inside this river is going to be low. So you're going to have a lot of light penetrating through, you're going to have a lot of oxygen. Compare that to the right. On the right we have a city that borders the river. We have a sewage treatment plant or sewage that actually um, is released inside the river. We also have some industry in which some of the byproducts are metals and phosphorus and nitrogen. Below that we have a farm. So this farmer is fertilizing his land. He's adding a source of sulfur, nitrogen, and phosphate, phosphate so that his plants can grow healthy. Now if we have a lot of rain, the nitrogen and phosphorus that's present in the soil will then run off into the river. Likewise, as this factory is um, in full production, some of the byproducts will also run off into the ocean. So we have added nutrients. We have added forms of organic matter from the sewage uh, plants. So they're sending untreated water or sewage into the, into the river. You're also having an increase in phosphorus and nitrogen. So in effect, you're actually allowing the microorganisms that are present inside that river to, to grow a lot faster. So they'll be more populated. In effect, they're uh, allowing less light to enter the, the rivers, and they're also depleting the oxygen. So under these conditions that we, we showed you on the right of this image, you're going to start by seeing an increase in algae and cyanobacteria. They're going to grow because there's a lot more nitrogen and phosphorus. There's tons of carbon dioxide and light on the surface, so these algae and cyanobacteria are going to grow in a lot more abundance. So as time goes on, we're going to see an increase in growth of the photosynthetic microorganisms. It's going to lead to an increase in organic matter because they're going to produce a lot more uh, carbohydrates, a lot more amino acids, lipids, etc. Their abundant growth will reduce the amount of, of light penetrating through the, the oceans. And as this algae die, they're going to add, um, they're going to decay or sediment to the bottom. In effect, they'll be taken up as nutrients from other, organic, uh, from other organisms present in the water. So I have here, based on the previous slide that I just showed you, as this algae die, they will begin to break apart, they will decompose, they'll be eaten up by aerobic bacteria. The bacteria that are used will use will deplete the amount of dissolved oxygen that's present in the water. They're going to slowly create what we call an anoxic condition. That's a condition where the amount of dissolved oxygen is decreased. Now, lack of dissolved oxygen will eventually lead to death of the aquatic organisms that require oxygen, such as the fish. Besides fish, some of the plants that are present in the bottom will also die because less sunlight will make it through and so there'll be less photosynthetic photosynthesis that it's going to happen. 
So as you see, that eventually you're choking um, the organisms that are living in the water. As these macroorganisms sediment or fall to the bottom, they're going to slowly fill uh, the, the floors of the lake, and the bottom of the lake is going to rise. So I have here that undegraded organic matter will settle to the bottom, and it will speed up the filling of the lakes. And this is also seen, but to a lesser degree, in the uh, marine biology, in the oceans and the seas. And this figure here sort of uh, gives you a visual of that increase in sediment rate. So originally the lake was um, at a certain depth shown here on the left, and as eutrophication occurred, that sediment rate increased on the right, and the lakes become shallower and shallower. You notice that there's fewer animals because it can only sustain fewer aerobic uh, microorganisms or fewer aerobic organisms that can live in that water because the amount of dissolved oxygen has decreased. So what I hope that, you can, that you'll be impressed upon this lecture is that the eutrophication is not always an instant phenomenon, but it's something that can happen gradually over time. Okay, so just as a review of what was presented in this lecture, is basically I would like you to leave this lecture knowing how microbes can affect the biotic and the abiotic factors that are present in their organisms. I'd like you to be aware of which organisms are considered as producers based on their form of metabolism, whether they're autotrophs or heterotrophs. These producers then are, are, uh, make food for the consumers, these consumers can be herbivores, carnivores. You can also have carnivores eating carnivores, but also you have the decomposers. So I'd like you to look at that trophic pyramid and see how these uh, producers, consumers, and decomposers are related to each other. I'd like you to give an example of each based on this lecture and the previous lectures. I'd like you to be aware of what a biogeochemical -geo cycle is, and there's actually one cycle for each element. And today I presented that of the carbon, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. I'd like you to, know, to, to be aware of what roles these microbes play in recycling these elements back into their atmosphere, back into their environment. Specifically, when I was talking about the nitrogen, uh, biogeochemical cycle, I've given you the terms of ammonification, nitrification, denitrification, assimilation, and nitrogen fixation. So I'd like you to be aware of what, uh, where these occur in the cycle. And lastly, I brought the fact about algal blooms in which they begin with the increase in nitrogen and phosphorus inside an aquatic body, which eventually leads to um, reducing the amount of dissolved oxygen that then kills aerobic microorganisms as well as macroorganisms that are present in these bodies of water. So the eutrophic eutrophication, uh, I'd like you to understand the process, how it starts out with um, photosynthetic autotrophs, their uh, uncontrollable growth. When they die, they add to the organic compounds or elements that are necessary for aerobic organisms, and then by Increasing the amount of aerobic organisms inside that body of water, they slowly decrease the amount of dissolved water, and they're slowly choking up these bodies of water. So that'll be it for environmental microbiology.